Straight ahead on CCX News, officer honored how the Plymouth Police Department is paying tribute to a fallen comrade. Plus, interesting insight into new home construction, why it's another banner year in Plymouth. And later, we head to New Hope, where we run into a room full of zombies. The rather frightening explanation coming up as CCX News starts right now. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. It has been five days since Wyzetta Police Officer William Matthews was struck and killed as he was removing debris from Highway 12. On Thursday, Officer Matthews will be laid to rest. But today, a visitation is taking place at Wyzetta Free Church on County Road 101 in Plymouth. Delane Cleveland is there, and he joins us live with more. Delane? Mike and Alex, the visitation began today at 3 p.m. and already there are people lined up to pay their respects. This is just a preview as to what will be a larger spectacle tomorrow in Plymouth and the surrounding area. The funeral will be held at this same location beginning tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thousands of law enforcement officers from across Minnesota, the region and the nation are expected to attend. It's an honor experience to be part of this uh, and to uh, pay our respects to Officer Matthews and support our, our fellow officers at the Wyzetta Police Department as, as they deal with this difficult time. So it truly is an honor for us to be involved in it um, and a privilege and one that we do not take lightly. Traffic in this area is going to be heavy. Two processions will make their way through Plymouth and Wyzetta. The first procession will feature hundreds of law enforcement officers. They will exit the church and head south on 101 to Wyzetta Boulevard. The procession will then make its way west along the shores of Lake Minnetonka, go north on Ferndale and back to Wyzetta Boulevard, heading west to Summit Park Cemetery. The second procession will follow about 20 minutes later. The Department of Public Safety says that road closures will be in place on Thursday from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. There will be traffic control officials out at the road closures to assist in providing some guidance and direction uh, as far as to alternative routes and things like that. So if individuals or motorists do come up to the closures and are confused, there will be uh, traffic control officials there to direct them on where they may go. Seating at the funeral is limited to law enforcement, family, and friends. So the public is, is in, uh, encouraged to come to the visitation to pay their respects, which goes until 8 p.m. tonight. If they're not able to make it, then they're asked to support along the procession route tomorrow. If you want a map of that route, you can go to the City of Plymouth website. Meanwhile, we will be here at the funeral tomorrow, so if you want to tune in to CCX, we will provide a recap of the day's events. Reporting live in Plymouth, Delaney, in Cleveland at CCX News. All right, Delane, thank you very much. The Brooklyn Center Police are asking for the public's help to identify a robber at a Brooklyn Center business. Photos released by police show the man who police say held up the family dollar store on 57th Avenue. The man had a firearm and pointed it at a store employee. The robber is believed to be in his early 20s. He had dreadlocks and is about six feet tall with a skinny build. Anyone with information on the case is urged to contact Brooklyn Center Police. The city of Plymouth is joining other communities in passing ordinances regulating level three sex offenders or those most likely to reoffend. While cities can't forbid sex offenders from living in their city, they can restrict where they live. Under an ordinance approved on Tuesday night by the Plymouth City Council, level three sex offenders are prohibited from living within 1,500 feet of any school, daycare, facility, park, or place of worship. No level three sex offender currently lives in Plymouth. A total of 10, though, live in the CCX News coverage area. Five in Brooklyn Center, three in Brooklyn Park, one in Golden Valley, and one in New Hope. 2017 turned out to be another big year for new home construction in Plymouth. Since 2014, the city has averaged nearly 300 single-family homes built per year. It's on pace to do that again this year. The average cost for the new homes is in the $600,000 range. One reason for all the growth is jobs. Plymouth is now has more than 54,000 jobs in the city, making it the fourth largest local economy in the state. That's behind only Bloomington, St. Paul, and Minneapolis. The local cities are getting a handle this month on what it will cost to keep everything running again in 2018. 
New Hope is proposing a budget increase of 1.3 percent next year. That's the city's smallest in two years. It'll fund a 2.5 percent raise for city employees, a new code compliance inspector, and more funds for the West Metro Fire District, among other items. And since home values have gone up, homeowners with a $200,000 home will see their taxes rise about $70. That would be a 6 percent increase. But officials point out this is just a starting point with much discussion ahead. Minnesota gets high marks from bicycling groups, and now Hennepin County is teaming up with Minneapolis to count pedestrians and bikers. And this time around, they are focusing on first-ring suburbs like Golden Valley. Here's reporter Sonia Goins. Winneka Avenue and Golden Valley Road is one of the busiest intersections in Golden Valley. Five, six, yeah. seven. Besides vehicles, there's a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists moving about in the area. County officials want to know just how many of those folks are using bike trails and sidewalks. Somebody crossing my screen line. Greg Anderson is a volunteer counter. His eyes are glued on the intersection, watching people come and go. The humans do the best job of, of getting the data and getting it right and watching where people are riding, if they're on the sidewalk or if they're on the streets. Counters are spread out in 30 different locations throughout the county. I've got all the way across Golden Valley Road, both sides. If they cross this, this line right here, I count them like that gentleman over there. The number crunchers work in two hour increments. Gathering the information is tedious and technical. Volunteers come out, we set up a screen line across the road in two directions. So if a person on a bicycle or a person walking, um, pushing a stroller or a skateboard, that sort of thing, crosses one of these lines, then they get marked down. The bike counter is automated. Special sensors on trails and roads record data as cyclists roll over them. Once the data is collected, officials will determine if changes need to be made to make the roads, sidewalks, and bike trails safer. We need to have a healthy, successful transportation system. We can't just keep jamming cars in uh, forever because they don't fit. We need these alternative forms. In Golden Valley, Sonia Goins, CCX News. The project wraps up on Thursday. Hennepin County officials will release the results sometime early next year. The North Hennepin Community College and four other schools have received some good news for future students. The National Science Foundation has given them a total of $5 million in grant funding that the schools can use to provide STEM scholarships to students. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. The schools are collaborating on this so that they can give future students the tools to succeed in these areas. The STEM scholarship program begins next year and is open to current high school students who qualify. If they are in this region and um, they should look out for the application to apply for the scholarship, and so they would have two years of scholarship at, you know, um, at North Hennepin that they would receive to complete um, a degree, AS degree, um, in, um, you know, at uh, North Hennepin Community College. And then they would have two additional years of scholarship to come to St. Cloud State so that they can graduate with a four-year degree in STEM and enter STEM workforce or go to graduate school or work for industry. One of the STEM goals is to try and bridge the achievement gap between whites and students of color. This is the first grant of its kind given to the state of Minnesota. Well, here's a scary thought. Up next, we are thinking Halloween. We're off to New Hope for tips to save on costumes. And plus, the second ranked Maple Grove girls soccer team looks for a little revenge against the team that knocked them out of the playoffs last season. That's coming up in sports. But first, turning more humid, there's a chance for thunderstorms on Thursday evening. Well, believe it or not, it's not too early for some people, at least, to start thinking about no, Halloween. No, don't say Maybe? it. <laughs> but thanks to the television show or shows like The Walking Dead or popular events like the zombie pub crawl, zombies will be a hot costume choice this year. Today in Money Savers, reporter Shannon Slatton explains how it's one of the easiest costumes to make with endless creative possibilities. At Arks Value Village in New Hope, the sales floor is ready and waiting. This week, these empty racks will become the boutique, a thrifty Halloween store where you can get everything you need for the perfect costume. <laughs> Cut myself shaving this morning. Molly King, the marketing manager for Arks Value Village, showed us how to put a creative spin on one of this year's hottest costumes. Zombies are hot right now. Dead hot. Plus, this week just happens to be fat. 
Fashion Week in the Twin Cities, so why not have a zombie fashion show? The thing with zombie costumes is they can be as creative as you want. Yeah, exactly. So like Molly's Coco Chanel. And so this is the zombified Coco Chanel of Fashion Week France, circa 1948. To be the real deal, you do need a few basics. First, all zombies need boots to survive the apocalypse. Then, a good story to back up your costume always helps. Car wreck. I can't see through these glasses. <laughs> Whatever outfit you find to wear, you need to make it look weathered and worn. Maybe you don't want to ruin your best black outfits. So you can come in and get a new outfit to distress or tear up. These models used a saw to create rips and tears. Yeah, make it look like it's been a rough night. It's been a rough 100 years. <laughs> and of course, smear everything with blood. You have to have some sort of death face and, and makeup. Zombies are an easy, fun costume that you can put as much or as little effort as you want. And if you shop at the boutique, you can make sure the only thing that isn't scary is the price. In New Hope, Shannon Slatten, CCX News. And the boutique opens up on Saturday and it runs until Halloween at all Arcs Value Village locations. Some good models and good acting there. Those guys are very <laughs> they, good at They've that. got wow. that roll down. <laughs> Still ahead, local college art teachers showcase their creativity at a new exhibit. But first, the scoreboard operator is busy as Cooper's soccer teams pile up the goals. John Jacobson has the highlights next in sports. I'm John Jacobson with sports. Armstrong's volleyball team is getting set for a big matchup against Champlin Park Thursday. First, they faced a young Osseo team. The Falcons at home to play the Orioles. Set one in Osseo's Kelsey Seelock. It's a kill and then an ace serve here to put the Orioles up 17-15. Then sophomore Lindy O'Jerry puts it down for the Orioles and they win set one, 25-23. Set two, Olivia Hecht with the Armstrong point on the big block for a 21-17 lead. Lauren Clark crushes the overpass for a Falcons point and Armstrong takes the set 25-18. Set three, nice back set by Armstrong's Riley Fry to Sophie Vogel. The Falcons build the lead. Osseo comes back, Hannah Carmen floating it over the defense and cutting the lead to one. But on set point, Clark gets the kill and Armstrong wins 25-22 for a 2-1 lead. Set four, Matty Zdenko gets the ace serve for Armstrong as the Falcons look to close it out. And on match point, Vogel gets the kill and the Falcons win the set 25-15. They take the match 3-1. The Maple Grove girls soccer team could not have started the season any better. The Crimson won their first six matches and did not allow a goal in any of those games. They were tested Tuesday, though. They hosted defending state class double-A champion Centennial. First half, great corner kick. Mia Omar right to Meredith Hawkinson, who heads it into the net and gets the Crimson on the board. Later, it's Omar taking the short pass from Emma Fournier, and she beats the keeper with her shot. Mabel Grove controls play in the first half, and they lead Centennial 2 to nothing. But the Cougars rally in the second half. Alexis Larson crosses to Mallory Monson. Her shot off of goalie Sarah Cortez and in, and Centennial scores the first goal by a Maple Grove opponent all year. And then it's Olivia Lovett getting by the D. She shoots and scores, and the match is tied at two with just 10 minutes remaining. But the Crimson win it late. Hawkinson is free, and her shot in front is off a defender and in. Her second goal of the match gives Maple Grove a 3-2 to two win. They'll face Park Center on Thursday and third-ranked Minneapolis Washburn Saturday. In the boys' match, Maple Grove looking to stay unbeaten. The Crimson dominate play. Cougars goalkeeper gets caught in traffic. Josh Moctimus just high with his header there, and it stays scoreless. Cameron Barber volleys a one-cut shot that gets over the keeper. Will Gallagher and under the crossbar and in for a goal for a 1-0 Crimson lead at halftime. Catching Maple Gallagher Grove keeper Matt Hennessy isn't tested much in this one. And, and Maple Grove wins 1-0 and, and improved to 5-0-1 oh, on the, the season. Been, been a tough start to the year for the Cooper boys soccer team, but the Hawks broke out with a good game Tuesday night as Richfield visited New Hope. Cooper leads 3-1 at the half and they add to their lead here. Goalkeeper can't control the bouncing ball and Alexis Martinez takes advantage. Tucking it home for a 4-1 Hawks lead. 
With a score four to two, Martinez delivers a nice touch pass to Lambe Wilson, and he puts it away. Great goal for the Hawks, and they lead it five to two. Richfield doesn't give up, though. John Dominic Poitos with a free kick into traffic. It bounces around before Emmanuel Sanchez gets control, and he buries it in the top corner here. And the Spartans pull within five to four. They get a good chance to tie it, but the shot by Yenka Fomoto is just high. Cooper wins his first game of the season, five to four. Cooper girls were looking for their fifth win of the season in their match against Richfield, and they strike early. Chelsea Estudo Garado with the corner kick. Nora Griffin Weisner heads it in for a one nothing lead. After another Hawks goal, Amelia Vija Lobos with the throw in. It bounces free. Jordan Sadler volleys it over the keeper and in, and Cooper leads 3 0 at halftime. Second half, and the Spartans keeper can't smother a ball. Evelyn Vija Lobos is there for the easy goal and a 4 0 Hawks lead. Ailey Snapko surrounded, but she gets enough space here to shoot the ball just inside the goal post for another Hawks goal. Snapko adds one more on a breakaway as Cooper improves to 5 1 and 1 with a 7 0 route over Richfield. Mike and Alex coming up on Thursday, starting at 4 on CCX News. A look ahead to week three of Friday Night Football. Ought to be good. Thank you, John. Up next, in the mind of a college art teacher. We will show you what they came up with over at North Hennepin when we come back. Well, finally, creativity is on full display at North Hennepin Community College this month. So here's a piece uh, by one of our uh, adjunct instructors, Andrew Stafford, and this is called an écorché, which is an oil-based clay. The 50th Faculty Art Show is now open at North Hennepin. The exhibit reflects 60 years of art through the eyes of 23 instructors who have taught at the school through the decades. This golden, golden anniversary edition of the show will stimulate your visual senses. On display is a potpourri of paintings, pictures, and sculptures. We have painting styles that go back to the ancient Egyptians using the encaustic technique. We have uh, different uh, types of uh, ceramic stoneware. We have oil paintings. We have, uh, we have photography. We have digital photography. And we have computer art. And don't forget, we have fabric. The art exhibit is open Monday through Friday through the end of September, and it is free. I bet it's fun for students to yeah. see some of their teachers' work. Cool stuff. That does it for us. Thanks so much for joining and us. And we'll see you back here again tomorrow, starting at 4.